Well, this is usually the toughest session of any conference. Uh, after lunch, carbs begin to kick in, and some of you are kind of thinking an afternoon nap would be better, but uh, we trust the Lord will help us to stay alert. I'd like you to turn again, please, to Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, uh, the verse that we have been kind of basing uh, the messages on today. Uh, and of course, uh, very familiar words. This is the last letter of the last chapter of the inspired pen of the apostle to the Gentiles. And um, as he writes to Timothy, he says in verse 5, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And he's saying to Timothy, he's saying, you may not be an evangelist by gifting Timothy, but do the work. Make full proof of your ministry. If your ministry is going to be truly proven as valuable by God, it cannot really be that way if you ignore the core message of Christianity, and that's the evangel, the good news concerning Jesus Christ. Preach that message. Timothy, get that message out. Be sure to do the work of an evangelist. And so in this uh, session, uh, I'd like to think about helps and hindrances to doing the work of an evangelist. Helps and hindrances to doing the work of an evangelist. And I want to begin with helps. Let's start on a very positive note. What will help us to be more effective in doing the work of an evangelist. And I'd like to, uh, all these uh, helps all begin with the same letter, so that will be helpful for you. They all begin with the letter T, uh, helps for doing the work of an evangelist. I want to begin with the letter T in terms of tears. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to turn to Psalm 126. Psalm 126, um, often applied and used uh, in connection with soul winning. And of course, uh, uh, verse 6, Psalm 126, verse 6, it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And certainly we know that what we're carrying is the precious seed of the Word of God. There's nothing more precious, right, than the message uh, that that hell-deserving sinners can know pardon and peace with God, sins forgiven, and a home in heaven. What a, what a wonderful, precious, precious message that is to be able to carry it. But he tells us that the one that goes forth carrying that message, but carrying it with tears, He says, that one shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, with great joy, as it were, bringing his sheaves with him. In other words, uh, there'll be a harvest as a result of the seed that is being sown. And of course, that seed that's sown is actually being watered by tears. Look at Acts 20, just again for this, uh, the same idea of tears. Paul's ministry in Ephesus, uh, longest place that he stayed and labored, labored there for three years, and he's called the elders uh, of the assembly together there, and he's, he's kind of recounting his labors amongst them and challenging them. Now it's their turn uh, to carry on with the work, and, and as he uh, speaks to them and uh, reminds them of his labors amongst them, One of the things that he can point to uh, is in Acts 20, verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember, but by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Wow, what a state. Very few men could ever say anything like that, right? That I labored there for three years, And I never cease for one minute to warn everyone, night and day, and it was not a dry, kind of unemotional delivering of a message, but it was giving you tears. 
What a challenge to you and I. The story is told of uh, two young Salvation Army officers, and they had gone to a rough district in Britain with the idea of starting a new rescue mission. And of course, when we think of the Salvation Army these days, we tend to think of kettles and and, uh, collections and that kind of thing. But in the early days, the Salvation Army were a power for God. William Booth's preaching apparently was so powerful, people would flock to hear him, and it wouldn't be unusual for people to actually fall on the ground under conviction of sin under his preaching of the gospel, which was the power attending the ministry of the Salvation Army. So these two young recruits, they went out, they labored in this district, and they were failing miserably. There was not much response. They were There was lots of opposition, and they got frustrated, they got tired, and they, they wrote to uh, General Booth, and they said, please, can we close the rescue mission? We're discouraged. We want to come home. He sent them a telegram. And there were only two words on that telegram. What he said was this, try tears. Try tears. And so, as they began to try tears, his advice was followed and there was a tremendous breakthrough in the work there and a marvelous turning to Christ occurred in that neighborhood. Try tears. Leonard Ravenhill, a uh, English preacher, once said this, we ought to weep because we have no tears for the lost. In other words, we should be convicted. We ought to blush that, uh, uh, that we're unashamed about our indifference to the plight of a lost world. He says we ought to get down before God and repent that we have no broken heart over lost sinners. It's often said of D.L. Moody that he never referred to hell without tears in his voice. It was those tears that compelled many to repentance and brokenness as Moody would speak of hell with tears running down his cheeks. And the result was that many found the Lord Jesus Christ. The difficulty is, you can't manufacture them, can you? Have you ever tried to pray with tears? It's not something you can manufacture. It's not something that you can work up, unfortunately. We just can't turn it on like that. But what you can do is say, Lord, give me a heart like my Savior. My Savior was not a dry-eyed preacher. He wept. He shed tears. Lord, do something to this cold heart of my catwoods and make me more like your son, the Lord Jesus, and give me tears. Scott DeGraff and I, were we pray together often on the telephone. We live three and a half hours apart, but we don't get to be together very often these days. But we still, at least once a week, try to pray together on the phone. And this particular day, uh, we were praying. Uh, he was in Topeka. I was in LaGuardia Airport on my way to a youth conference. And uh, uh, as we began to pray uh, on the phone, suddenly just a burden, the weight of the state of the church and the plight of the lost came upon us. And both of us began to weep. So here we are, Verizon Wireless, speaking in our cell phones, and all we're doing is weeping like babies. We couldn't get words out. Nothing would come out. So we just stayed there weeping. And I want to tell you, that youth conference, the Lord moved in power. People's lives were affected eternally. And I believe that tears is something so lacking in today's church. So has been so lacking in my own life. And 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 I want to say, Lord, I, I, I want to be like you. I, I don't have... The, the compassion that I should. Will you do something with this cold heart and melt it with tears for a lost world? And then a second T that I want to bring before us this afternoon, and that's the T of testimony. One of the great ways that we can share our faith is by sharing your story. 
I kind of love t- uh, testimonies, and you rarely ever have testimony meetings anymore. I think we should have testimony meetings. I love to hear what God has done in someone's life. It's just a delight and a thrill. And Paul frequently used his testimony in the Word of God. Uh, it's mentioned in Acts 9. It's mentioned in Acts 21. It's mentioned in Acts 26. And each time there's, it's not that it was, but he just gives different details and he just kind of keeps adding. And it's not embellishing anything, but, but there's just different angles he used. But he keeps telling his testimony and he used it in that way. And if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, here's another occasion when he uses his testimony. And in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And then he begins to give his story. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says this, of whom I am he. And so Paul loved to use his testimony. And a wonderful thing that you can do is use your testimony. Uh, If you're uncomfortable about giving out gospel tracts, why not write your testimony out, publish it as a tract, and and say to somebody, I'd like to share my story with you. Would you mind reading this? I find it so much easier to give out a tract that's got a personal note to it. Right? Or somebody I know. Something that... It's just easy to do that. So maybe that's something you should do. Uh, use opportunities. There's tremendous power in the testimony of a transformed life, right? And and of course, you can't argue against it. This is what God has done for me in Christ. Let me tell you my story. And it's interesting that even in terms of gospel work, some of the most effective evangelists have understood the power of testimony. Uh, There's a a man called J.J. Rouse, he was a pioneer uh, of uh, the gospel and, and, and assembly work in northern Ontario. And this man would go into a community, often into logging communities up in northern Ontario, and what he would say is, he'd ask around, who's the worst sinner in this area? And then he'd be told, and he would go to that man's house first, and he'd start there. And he'd share the gospel with the one who was the worst sinner. And once that guy was saved, he would, he would use him as exhibit A of the power of the gospel. And, and it, it worked. It was very effective. Now, he was willing to go to great lengths. He went to one guy's house, and it was one of these houses where there were steps going up, and the front door was kind of uh, high up. So he went up to the front door, knocked on the door, uh, and it, the guy uh, opened the door, and J.J. Rouse began to share the gospel with him, and this guy punched J.J. Rouse right on the nose, knocked him down the stairs. J.J. Rouse got up, dusted himself down, climbed up the stairs again, knocked on the door again. The guy came out, hit him a second time. J.J. Rouse got up, went up a third time. The guy says, okay, come on in. Shared the gospel, and that man got saved, and he was the, the publicity for the gospel campaign. Another one, and I just heard of this guy recently, was a man called Mordecai Ham. You've all heard of Billy Graham, but let me tell you, Billy Graham got saved under the preaching of Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham, actually, Billy Graham was so convicted by Mordecai Ham's preaching, he joined the choir so that he could get away from the stare of Mordecai Ham when he was preaching. So Billy Graham singing in the choir... And, and Mordecai Ham begins to preach and he says, I want to tell you there's some right sinners in the, in the choir today that need to get saved. <laughs> and that's when Billy Graham got saved. But Mordecai Ham, same thing. He would go into a district and he would ask, who's the worst sinner 
I'm going to get it. You go after that individual, and after a while, his reputation spread, and when it was known he was coming into the area, all the bad sinners would hide because they were frightened. Mordecai Ham was coming after them. And he, this guy, I mean, he, would, he, he found one guy hiding under a, a hay rack, you know, kind of a, a pile of hay, and he, he, he got him out, and he said, I'm praying that God will either convert you or kill you. You talk about boldness. <laughs> now, not everybody can do that. I wouldn't suggest you do that to anybody unless the Holy Spirit tells you to do that, right? But I'm praying that, the, that God will either kill you or convert you. And the guy would get on his knees right there and then and receive Christ out of fear. Isn't that amazing? And so all I'm saying is testimony. Testimony is a powerful thing. Uh, it, it's something that's undeniable. It, it's a transforming thing. And these guys, they operate on the basis, Lord, give me a Lazarus. And once I've got a Lazarus raised from the dead, as it were, people will come. By the way, they had a, a, a methodology in their thinking. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse, 20, uh, and verse 9. John 12, verse 9. And it says this, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he, that's the Lord Jesus, was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they, that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. So the crowds came, not just because Jesus was in town, but they wanted to get a look at Lazarus. <laughs> I want to see this guy that was raised from the dead. And there's suddenly this curiosity. And so if we could see some of the chief sinners in our community come to Christ, people would show up just out of curiosity to see what happened. Right? And so testimony is a powerful, powerful tool under the hand of God. And uh, again, use your testimony. I'd like to challenge you, if you've never done it, to take the time to write out your testimony so you know it well, and then ask the Lord, Lord, will you give me an opportunity to share my story with somebody this week? Because it's easy to tell, it ought to be easy to tell your own story, right? Not hard. Give me a chance to tell my story. And uh, I believe the Lord will honor that. If you sincerely desire that, the Lord will honor that. And of course, um, the next T, is, and I don't want to minimize, we already talked about it last night, but I just feel like I need to emphasize again, the helper, the, the, the Spirit of God. Uh, the Lord Jesus has told us uh, that He was not going to leave us to do this task of world evangelism on our own, but he was sending a helper who would, as it were, bear uh, testimony with us as we go out with the gospel. And uh, I, I just feel that we need to recognize the important role of the comforter. And I just want you to look at John 15 for a moment, uh, just to see this. Um, <coughs> We just break in um, in verse 26. It says, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And so what he's saying is, when you, when you go out, you're actually not going out on your own. Uh, he'll go with you. And he will testify of me with you. In other words, everything is confirmed in the Bible in the word of two or three witnesses, right? So he says, you go and talk, and I'll come along with you, and I'll do the talking too. By the way, when he does the talking, people better listen, right? The Spirit of God speaking. And so, so the idea is the Holy Spirit's given to us to enable us, to help us, to, 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 to uh, uh, be able to share the message. In fact, 
the, Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit loves the Lord Jesus so much that, that he says he, he, he's not going to speak about himself. He, he, he'll glorify me. And he loves to speak about the Lord Jesus. When you say, Lord, I think I'd like to go and talk about the Lord Jesus. You know what the Holy Spirit says? Sign me up. I'm coming too. I'm serious. I mean, I say that reverently and respectfully, but when you want to speak about the Lord Jesus to people, the Holy Spirit gets really excited and says, I'm with you all the way. I want to speak about him too. And I'm I'm coming. I'll be along with you to enable you, to equip you, to overcome all your difficulties and all of your your apprehensions. I'll I'll be with you. Look at... uh, uh, back please at Luke's gospel for a second that I, I want to just share that this has been something the Lord has really been teaching my own heart uh, and again let me just be honest confession is good for the soul um, when I first was saved our, our church in England got split uh, very early on with the charismatic movement and a lot of people left and they went to the charismatic movement and we didn't we stayed with the group uh, but for, I would say for, for a number of years in the church, those that stayed behind, you almost didn't mention the Holy Spirit for fear you'd be caught in suspicion of being a charismatic. You know what I'm saying? And so it took me, in all honesty, 30 years to recover from that charismatic spirit. Personally, I was petrified of anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And so if you're not working, conscious of dependence on the Holy Spirit, how are you doing it? In the energy of the flesh, aren't you? And what does the flesh produce? Only what flesh can produce. Not much. And in recent years, um, it's almost, I almost feel like I got saved again. No, I didn't. I, did, I was saved in 1981. But just a fresh consciousness of the person and work of the Holy Spirit just was so wonderful. I'm enjoying my Christian life now more than I've ever enjoyed it. And I say that because, because I suddenly rediscovered the vital truth of the Spirit of God. And as I was reading one morning, Luke 4, because Luke presents the Lord Jesus to us as the dependent man. Uh, and of course, there's more in Luke about the prayer life of the Lord Jesus than any other gospel. And there's more in Luke about his relationship to the Holy Spirit than there is in any other gospel. Because, because the Holy Spirit, through Luke, is presenting the Lord Jesus to us as the second man, the last Adam, that dependent man. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And of course, we know that in the wilderness, uh, he was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's interesting that the leading of the Spirit actually led him right into face-to-face confrontation with Satan himself. Sometimes we think if I'm being led by the Spirit, everything's going to go wonderful, there'll never be any problems. That's a misunderstanding. It could be that you're right in the will of God in the middle of trial and difficulty and the Spirit's leading in that. Right? Sometimes we think if I'm led by the Spirit, everything's going to go wonderful. That's just not reality. Right? He's led by the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice verse 14. Jesus returned. This is after his days in the wilderness. How did he return? In the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And then he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth and he gets up to read from the Scriptures. And This is what he says in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because... He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And again, can I just say this with all respect and all reverence? It dawned on me when I read this passage if the Lord Jesus, as dependent man, saw the need for the fullness of the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, and the power of the Spirit, who am I to think I could possibly remotely live anything like Jesus Christ in my own strength and my own energy? It's folly, brothers and sisters. If the dead dependent man lived in dependence on the Spirit of God, I better be dependent on the Spirit. If I want to see anything done for God, and so please, don't be, uh, as it were, terrified of the person who, who is God's holy dove. He descended in the form of a dove. Whoever was scared of a dove? Come on, folks! The Bible says, harmless as a dove. The Holy Spirit will not harm you. He's the helper, not the harmer. The helper. Embrace the Spirit of God in your life and ministry. Express your dependence on Him. Yield yourself fully to the Spirit of God. Let Him take you up and use you. And so, there's tears, there's testimony, there's the helper. Oh, how we need the helper. Look again, we read in Acts 4 about, remember we said that they prayed for boldness. Uh, these apostles, they'd been told not to speak in the name of Jesus. And we already uh, read from this and, and uh, we, we emphasized that they cried out uh, that they might make known the name of the Lord Jesus and, and be able to speak boldly about him. And verse 31 says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. And again, if we are going to boldly articulate the message of the cross, we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that effectively. And by the way, they actually prayed for boldness. And again, the Holy Spirit said, we want boldness to speak in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said, sign me up. He came and filled them so they could speak the word of God with boldness. And then, <clears throat> look again at Acts 11. I just want you to see the, the tremendous emphasis. You know, the, the Acts of the Apostles, when you read the Acts of the Apostles, um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that... Um, these, these people turn the world upside down. We know that. And um, we, we talk about New Testament Christianity and we want to follow New Testament principles. But I want to tell you that New Testament principles without New Testament power are as dry and lifeless and they're miserable. We want New Testament principles. I believe them 100%. But they must be carried out in New Testament power. Because if not, they'll be as dry as old stick. And you know, you've been in meetings that have everything right, right? You know, kind of, you know, they, they dot the I's, they cross their T's, and they're as dull and lifeless and as dry as the dust on Pharaoh's mummy. Aren't they? What's wrong? There's New Testament principles, but there's no New Testament power. And in the Acts of the Apostles, in 28 chapters, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 50 times in 28 chapters. Is that, is that just by chance? Or is that trying to tell us something? If we want to turn the world upside down like they did, we need the same person working in and through us, right? If we're going to do anything for God. And I think the Acts of the Apostles is a misnomer, to be honest. Don't you? Because it's just the Acts of the Apostles. Remember where we found them last night? Bolted in an upper room, petrified. Right? The book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. That's what Acts is. That's a big difference. 
And so Acts 11. Who, when he came, this is speaking of Barnabas, had seen the grace of God, was glad and exalted them all that with purpose of heart that they would cleave to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Why? Because Barnabas is a good man and because he's full of faith and he's full of the Holy Spirit and much people were added unto the Lord. And so, can I encourage us again afresh, folks? We, we, we just, we are in a day and age that unless the Holy Spirit does something in our hearts, we're in a day of terrible decline. And I think part of it is we've reacted so much against charismatic error that we've allowed the pendulum to go so far to the other extreme that most of us are scared to death of the heavenly helper. And because of that, we're doing stuff in our own strength and we're getting what we can produce. And that's all we're getting. If you're content with that, you just carry on. I'm done with that. I'm tired of that. I want to see a work done for God where the only explanation is God. That's the kind of work I want to be part of. That the only thing people say is, look what God has wrought. Not look what Brother so and has done, or this organization has done. Look what God has done. So the next T. The next T is travail over souls. Travail over souls. And it, it goes along with tears in a sense, but it it's finds its expression in prayer. I'd like you to go look at Colossians with me for a moment. In the curious case of Epaphras in the book of Colossians. This man, Epaphras. And in Colossians 1, uh, we learn that this church in Colossae was not started by the Apostle Paul. Uh, in fact, he'd actually never been there and he'd never seen them. And so we read in verse 3 of chapter 1, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereon you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and, know, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So it would seem that the, the, the man who brought the Colossians to Christ was a man called Epaphras. And he labored actually in the Lycus Valley. And he wasn't just uh, in Colossae, but he saw success in Hierapolis and Laodicea. And he'd, see, he'd been involved in the establishment of three New Testament churches in the Lycus Valley. Tremendously used of God, this man Epaphras. Uh, and so now let's go to chapter 4. So what happens is that after he'd established these churches, he's the evangelist, he's preached the gospel, he's seen people saved, and a wonderful work has been done, and then all of a sudden false teaching begins to come in and threaten the church there. And so Epaphras goes to see Paul and begins to share, Paul, his concern for the spiritual well-being of the saints in Colossae, and he begins to tell Paul about what's come in. And so Paul takes up his mighty pen as he's moved by the Spirit of God and begins to write a letter. But before he takes up his pen and writes a letter, let me suggest to you the scenario. Paul's in prison. Epaphras comes and he begins to tell him this story. And I imagine Paul saying, okay, brother, let's pray about it. You think Paul might have said, let's pray about it? You think so? Paul was a tremendous man of prayer, wasn't he? 
So I want to suggest you, before he got to writing letters or anything else, he said, let's just pray about it, brother. So, so here's the scene. I'm using my sanctified imagination here. But here's Paul and Epaphras in prison. The, uh, Epaphras visiting him there, kneeling down to pray. And Paul begins to listen to Epaphras as he prays. And he's thinking to himself, no wonder God used this man. Let me read his words. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record. I take the witness stand. That's what he means. I bear him record. I'll testify on his behalf. I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So he says, I want to take the witness stand and tell you about this guy. I heard him pray. This guy, he doesn't just pray. He labors fervently for you always in prayer. I want to testify to this man. His prayer is passionate. He's laboring fervently to labor, to, to labor to the point of weariness. And then fervently, it, it, fervent means hot. Like this guy's hot in his prayers, right? I mean, there's, there's a bit of heat there. You know, the tragedy of the American church is apathetic, anemic prayer music. You ever been in one? You say all the time. Right? You ever been in a prayer meeting where people are agonizing in prayer? They might be agonizing because they ate too much lunch. They're not agonizing in prayer. I've been in one. I want to tell you, I've been in a prayer meeting. Never forget it as long as I live. It was in the north of Ireland. Getting ready for a gospel service. And there were grown men prostrate on the ground, crying out to God for the salvation of souls, many of them weeping. And I was supposed to preach the gospel that night. I never witnessed anything like it in my life. I thought, now that's the prayer. These people are doing business with God. These people are serious. These people know what it is to travail over souls. And so, I want to suggest that if we want to see, uh, who wants to see people get saved? Anybody here want to want to see a harvest of souls? Uh, almost everybody. Some of you didn't just so tired because of the carb. You couldn't even lift your hands up. But yeah, but I get the idea that that it, all of us realistically would love to see a harvest of souls. We all want spiritual babies, but nobody wants to go through the birth. That bottom line. We don't want to go through the labor pains, but we want the babies. We want the babies. They come with birth pains. That's the way it is. Look at a, a, an Old Testament reference. I want to just turn you back to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, and it's very telling on this matter of travail over souls. This is what we're talking about. Men like Epaphras, laboring fervently for you in prayer. Isaiah 66, verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once. Then notice what it says. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Travailed, she brought forth her children. <laughs> the interesting thing, shall the nation be born again in one day? Born in one day. Actually, the nation of Israel, all Israel are going to be saved. We saw that in our Roman class. But you know before all Israel are going to be saved, in Zechariah 12, 
it tells us what's going to happen. In fact, let's just turn there for a second. Just turn to Zechariah. Uh, if you just find Matthew and go backwards, you'll be in Zechariah pretty quickly because it's the one of the last of the minor prophets. And in Zechariah chapter 12, In verse uh, 10, well, let's, let's break in from um, verse 9. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Just stop there. So, what God is going to do when, they're, when Israel is surrounded by enemies, this is the battle of Armageddon, and they're going to wipe out the nation of Israel, God says he's going to pour upon that nation, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, he's going to pour on that nation the spirit of grace and of supplications. What does that mean? Um, in other words, God is going to do something amazing, undeserved. What does this nation deserve? Actually, they deserve to be wiped out. They've lived in unbelief for centuries. Uh, they've not believed their Messiah, but he's going to pour out the Spirit of grace. And then he says, and supplication. In other words, the nation are going to begin to cry out to God. A nation that's ignored him. That's re- and they're going to cry out to God. And I know exactly what they're going to say. You know what they're going to say? Hosanna. Hosanna! Hosanna! You know what that means? Save now! Save now! Save now! And they cry out to God. Save. In other words, we're surrounded. There's no hope for us, God. Unless you save, it's all over. Save now. And God's going to pour out that spirit of supplication upon them. And it says, in that very same verse, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. I suspect that when they cry out, Hosanna, save now, it'll be travailing prayer. Right? In other words, Lord, unless you answer this, it's all over. We're dead. We're done. We're finished, right? And they're going to cry out. And it's not going to be anemic. It will not be an anemic prayer meeting. It will be a travailing meeting. The Lord will answer in a powerful way. And so back in Isaiah 66, remember what we read? As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. That's when God stepped in. And that word travail... Uh, the Hebrew word, it means to labor, to rise, to tremble. It, it, it has the idea of very hard work, like the pains of childbirth, intense pain, agony, toil. And I suspect to you that part of the reason that our church today, for the most part, is really not seeing many babies born is because none of us want to go through birth time. We don't know how to travail in prayer. We don't have many Epaphrases amongst us who will labor fervently in prayer. They, we just don't have those. I pray for them. I, I, I say, Lord, give us... I want the Lord to raise up evangelists. I want the Lord to raise up shepherds. I want Him to raise up teachers who will teach in the power of the Spirit. And I'm praying, Lord, raise up intercessors. I have a friend. He's praying for me this weekend. This brother, uh, saved in the 70s, that, that movement of God at that time, hasn't really been very fervent in his life for the Lord, but in recent years, the Lord has brought him to himself. And he said, Mike, I've committed myself to the ministry of intercession. And he said, what I spend my days doing is just crying out to God. And he said, Mike, I want you to know you're on my list. I pray for you every place you go and every place you preach. And if that man had said to me, Mike, I want to give you a bar of gold, it wouldn't have meant as much to me as him telling me that you're on my list. I pray for you. 
What a gift from the Lord to have people like that. But we need people like that. We need people that learn to travail. I, my prayer is that this building will not be just a place of instruction. It will be a place where people come and agonize over lost souls. People learn how to travail. That people not only learn how to do sketchboard at Tepsi, but they know how to do business with God in prayer. I'd love to see that. That would make a big difference on this world. It really would. And that's what we need, folks. We need people who will travail. Uh, we'll need people who will, will agonize. Our Lord Jesus, it says, He shall see the travail of His soul and be satisfied. Do we know anything of that? Lord, help us, right? Uh, I've been praying. One of my biggest prayer requests these days is, Lord, teach me to pray. Is that interesting? Like, I mean, I've been in the Christian service since 1984, and, and sadly, relatively recently, I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, teach me to pray. I need help in that area. You need help in that area? I need help. Lord, I want to learn to be a man of prayer. I want to, I want to learn how to be an Epaphras, to, 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 be, to labor fervently in prayer. Uh, and, and I, I've, uh, and, and it is a, it's a learning process. Scott DeGraff and I, we, we've talked about this a lot. And one day we said, look, we've done enough talking. Uh, so we, we, we booked ourselves in a hotel halfway between his house and my house. And we said, we're going to go lock ourselves in to a hotel room and we're going to pray all night and seek the face of God. So we got in this room. Well, we had all kinds of plans. We, we, were, we were going about an hour and then we were done. I mean, we're so inept at prayer that after an hour we were, we were totally exhausted. We wanted to go to bed and sleep. So we said, okay, we'll just, we'll just sit on separate beds and we'll just read the scriptures. And as we read the scriptures, God kind of refueled us and we came together and prayed. And then we'd pray until we were done then we'd go sit and read scriptures, get more fuel, come back and pray. And before we knew what it was, it was time to go get breakfast the next morning. And we had a wonderful experience with God. And the Lord is helping us but, but we're realizing that if we really want to see God work in our generation, we have to learn to travail over souls. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. And here's, a, here's a, a great encouragement, by the way, to the sisters that are here. And I want to give some encouragement to the sisters that are here. Um, first of all, you can be powerful evangelists in the sense that the woman that led me to Christ, <laughs> it was a woman, right? And God has often used women to share one-on-one -on -one the gospel message in a very powerful way. And First Samuel 1 and verse 10 talks about a lady called Hannah. And notice it says, um, and, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord God of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Here's a woman... And in those days, barrenness was a tremendous stigma. It was a real reproach for a woman not to have children. And she said, Lord, I don't want to be a barren bride anymore. And she wept. And she, she travailed. Give me children. Give me a son. I'll give him back to you, Lord. You know, the, she lived in a day where the men were spiritually inept. Eli, the high priest, remember him? His worthless sons. Like this is, these are the, supposedly the spiritual leaders of the nation, and they are spiritual disasters. And the prayers of one woman would change the whole nation. Because that Samuel would go around in a circuit preaching. And the whole tide of the history of Israel was about to change. 
to the ministry of Samuel. And it came in answer to a prayers of a woman. And I want to suggest to you that she was tired of being a barren bride and I'm tired of being part of a barren bride. And we need some Hannah. We need some sisters because sadly, like the days of Samuel, we have a lot of inept men in our day. Sorry guys, but that's just the way it is. We have a lot of inept men. And we need some Hannahs who will weep and cry out to God for fruitfulness. We need that. We, 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 we desperately need people who will travail over souls. We need Epaphras. God raise up Epaphras like men for our day. God raise up Hannah's for our day. God raise up a generation of intercessors who learn how to do business with you, who know what it is to agonize, who know what it is to wrestle with God. Lord, would you, would you deliver us from anemic prayer meetings? Give us prayer meetings where people really pray about the elephant in the room. You go, I go to assemblies and they're hanging by a thread. Humanly speaking, if the Lord be not come, it's done, it's over. And you would think things were wonderful. Because nobody ever prays about the real issue. All we pray is that sick people will live forever. Lord, whatever, whatever you do, don't let them go to heaven. Please, keep them out of there as long as you can, right? Isn't that how we pray? Like here's somebody 90 years of age. Lord, would you raise them up again? Come on, let them go. Let them go home, right? All we ever pray about is physical and material things. I need a good job. My son needs a good job. Uh, in other words, we need to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and live here forever. That's not Christianity. It's materialism. That's what it is. We want to be materially successful and that's the life we want to live and, and the last thing we want to do is go to that heaven place. I'm not saying it's not important to pray when somebody's sick. If you want to pray for somebody who's sick, go to their bedside, read the scriptures with them and pray with them. That'll do them a lot more good. But in the prayer meeting, let's pray for sick assemblies. And sick saints who are not sick physically, but sick spiritually, because they have, they're apathetic. They have got no spiritual verve and vibrancy in their life at all. And you can hardly tell them apart from unbelievers. We should be praying for, I remember being in a prayer meeting and, and, and somebody begins to pray and they say, Lord, restore these backsliding brethren. I thought, praise the Lord. This guy's really getting right, right close to where it should be, right? helps to do the work of an evangelist. Great helps, tears, Lord, do something with this hard heart. Testimony, Lord, give me an opportunity to tell people my story. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Give me a chance to tell my story. Lord, just make it fresh again to me. Sometimes I wonder if we got so used to the fact that we're saved and on our way to heaven that we've almost lost the wonder of it all. I don't think Paul ever lost the wonder of it all. He never got over it. He loved me, he says, and gave himself for me. And it's almost like, I can't get over this. I was once a blasphemer and injurious, and he counted me worthy, putting me in the ministry. And he said, oh, wow. He never got over it. Folks, are you getting over it? You should never be in recovery from getting saved. Right? You should be in a recovery program all your days, right? In the sense of, I can't get over it that he would love someone like me. And so tell that story. Share it. And then the helper. Don't forget the helper, folks. Don't forget the helper. You can't do this yourself. 
That which his flesh is flesh. That's all it can produce. That which is the spirit of the spirit is the spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to work. And then finally, uh, travail over souls. Lord, help me. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Every revival that has happened in the history of the world, you can find someone, somewhere, travailing over souls. You've all probably heard of um, the revival ministry of Charles Grandison Finney. By the way, his lectures on revival are powerful. They're an amazing read. But Finney, we've all heard of Finney, but there were two other individuals that many people have never heard of. One was a guy called Abel Clary. The other was a guy called Daniel Nash. Both were men that were called to preach, but because of ill health, were never really able to preach. Abel Cleary had tuberculosis, and uh, would often be uh, sweating and coughing up blood and all the rest of it. But he devoted his ministry to intercessory prayer. And he would pray and agonize. And he, he began to pray for different communities in upstate New York, and he'd pray for this town, and he'd pray and pray for the souls there. And then he'd pray for another town further out, and another town. And, and without knowing it, the towns where Finney saw his great success in revival followed the same route as Abel Clary's prayers. Finney had no idea this was going on. After Abel Clary died, then his usefulness as an evangelist ended. You didn't see revival anymore. Isn't that interesting? Nobody's ever heard of Abel Clary, but if it wasn't for Abel Clary, nobody would have ever heard of Charles Sanderson. There was a man there, like a pepper. Never could preach because of TB. But he devoted himself to the ministry of Jesus. And the rest, as they say, is history. Daniel Nash, same thing, devoted himself to prayer. These men impacted the ministry. Powerful for Charles Jonathan Finney. So, Lord, raise up a Finney. But Lord, be sure to raise up a Clary and a Nash as well. And Lord, what about me? What's my role? What do you want me to do? Am I going to be a Hannah, dear sister? Are you going to be a Hannah for God? Are you, are you tired of an apathetic church, of spiritual barrenness? Would you cry out to God to turn the tide? Would you cry out to God to raise up some Samuel so that we could be done with these Eli's? We're, we're tired of Eli's, right? We don't want any more. We, we need some Hannah. Could you be one of these? Lord, help us. Help us. We're, we, we are in a desperate state right now. And we need God to do something. But we haven't talked about the hindrances. we we'll have to wait for 3 30 for the hindrances. So let's just pray. And then they're going to come and pray. It's okay to pray more than once, isn't it? Is that legitimate? Okay. Oh God, we just, uh, we're, we're so needy today. And the tragedy is that many of us don't realize how needy we are. Uh, we're like the, the frog in the, the pan, as it were, and we're oblivious of the danger we're in. Lord, the church is anemic. Prayer meetings are anemic. In fact, prayerlessness might just be the sin of our generation. Oh Lord, would you somehow turn the tide? And Lord, start with us in this room. Lord, would you start with me? I, I don't want to be contributing to the deadness of the church in North America. Lord, I, I'd like to be used of you in a fresh way. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me for ignoring the Spirit of God. For being so scared of error that I've become guilty of error by allowing the pendulum to go so far to the other extreme of actually being content with the flesh-driven ministry. Lord, forgive us. 
Deliver us from this foolish thinking. Bring us into line with your heart and your ways. We'll give you all the glory because you alone are worthy. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.